So first I want to thank Attorney General Josh Stein for being flexible with our schedule. I wanted him to be here in the keynote hour and he's agreed to wait and be here at the keynote hour so he's coming on in just a few minutes. And we've given the um, honor of introducing Josh to our director at the Center for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention, Dr. Alice Ammerman. So I'm passing the torch to Dr. Anna Ammerman. She's the director of our center. She's our leader and she's going to introduce our keynote speaker for the day. Well, we are so pleased to have the No Kid Hungry crew in our center. They do such wonderful work, and it's all reflected by the amazing work that all of you do. And I really look forward to this conference every year and hearing all of your stories and all about your good work. Very honored to be able to have the opportunity to introduce um, the Attorney General, Josh Stein. Um, in keeping with the spirit of the morning, um, I'm sure that Attorney General Josh Stein has had a few rap sheets that he's had to look at in the past, but I'm guessing he's never had a rap introduction. So I'm going to give that a try. Um, <laughs> this is only my second rap. Um, after my first rap, um, it was mentioned that that um, the woman with the no-nonsense bun uh, was the, <laughs> doesn't that sound like a hipster? <laughs> so I'm not very good at the hand stuff, so, but I noticed that you guys were really good at that earlier. Now really lower your expectations from this morning when, uh, when we had Josh Ramsey here. So, so here we go. Um, and just remember, AG is Attorney General. So, all right. To find out more about this guy, the, uh, the AG Adam Stein, I stalked him on the internet. I hope that's not a crime. <laughs> Give credit to my 24-year-old who came up with that. Uh, from Dartmouth, he did graduate. To Harvard, he then went. Learning law and public policy is how the time he spent. He started as state senator and deputy attorney that launched him on his justice path and an amazing journey. Elected by the citizens, a warning here, I have to use two different accents to make this fit. Um, one British and one Southern. So, um, elected by the citizens along with Governor Cooper. Um, as a team for North Carolina, they are nothing short of super. And I'd like to give a round of applause for the team. He's protected NC families from crime, consumer fraud. His skills in social justice are both deep as well as broad. Look out, you payday lenders and loan sharks on the prowl. If you mess with A.G. Stein, you know he's going to call a foul. <laughs> Josh Stein is not a loner. He teams up with more A.G.s, and together they had impact from the mountain to the seas. Of course, there were the opioids. Uh, of of course, there are the opioids, the problem of our time. Opioids and epidemic are both words that have no rhyme. <laughs> that was, that's lame, I recognize. <laughs> I tried to work in asteroids, but it just didn't pass. So. OK, you only have to tolerate one more verse here. Get your, get your flashlights out, pretend they're microphones, get ready to do this. So you ready? And I forgot to talk to the guy in the back, Andrew, about getting some music on this. but. <laughs> or the dude in the back, I should say. OK, our awesome A.G. Stein will be igniting lots of lights, looking out for all our children, and protecting all our rights. All right. <laughs> what is going on at this conference? That was an awesome introduction, Alice. Uh, and I must say, I must say also unique. Uh, if I had any rhyming talent, I would be able to come up with something. But that's not what I got. Um, Lou Ann Crumpler, my good friend, thank you for the invitation to be with you. And I thank the work of No Kid Hungry. I mean, what you all do is incredibly important to the lives and welfare, well-being of young people, and really the future of North Carolina. 
Um, I, I want to, obviously we're going to talk about childhood hunger, but I do want to say a word about what happened in Florida yesterday because uh, of its tragic nature. Trying to find the words, and I'm not sure words exist to actually express human feeling, uh, but I do want folks to know that I've talked with my staff and we're doubling down on everything we can do at the Department of Justice to try to get at the root causes of uh, horrendous incidents like that. And that means engaging the issues of, of bullying, mental illness, substance abuse, exposure to violence, and keeping guns out of the wrong hands. Uh, and we are gonna keep doing that work. Uh, well, with that said, Uh, I want to um, say what an honor it is to be with you all this morning, uh, and it is an honor to serve as your Attorney General. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to do that. I've been on the job about a year, and I tell you, I love it uh, because I get to go to work every day and try to protect people here in North Carolina in a host of different ways. We protect seniors and consumers at the Department of Justice from scam artists and corporations that break the law to try to steal people's hard-earned money. And last year, we won settlements and awards of $75 million to return to consumers and the state. Most businesses, as you well know, play by the rules, but there are some unscrupulous ones out there that don't, and when they do that, we're gonna hold them accountable. I also protect the taxpayers from tax cheats and health care providers that defraud Medicaid. We return tens of millions of dollars to the state of North Carolina uh, in recoveries. Same thing, most health care providers, nearly all health care providers do things the right way, but there are those few ones out there that try to skim the system and take money that needs to go to actually providing people who need it health care. Uh, and when they don't do that, um, the rest of us are forced to pay more than our fair share, and it's not right, and we won't accept that. <laughs> Attorneys in my office help fight to get kids the child support they're entitled to under the law. Last year, we did that in more than 200 instances here in North Carolina. We protect the air that we breathe and the water we drink. Uh, there's a chemical company outside of Fayetteville named Camores that had been discharging potentially dangerous chemicals into the Cape Fear River, which provides drinking water for much of southeastern North Carolina, including Wilmington. On behalf of the Department of Environmental Quality, my office sued that company, and while the litigation is ongoing, the court has ordered that it cease discharging that chemical into the river. To me, it's real basic. When folks are drinking water out of their tap, they should have confidence that that water is safe and clean. We protect families from crime in a number of different ways, and we also fight the opioid epidemic that is taking too many lives, uh, too many people are dying each year, and too many families are experiencing the pain of a loved one living with substance use disorder. The opioid ed epidemic actually plays a contributing factor into the issue that is the agenda of the day, which is child hunger, because there are too many parents who are incapable of caring for their children, and the children are left to fend for their own, or they go with their grandparents or someone else who may not have the resources to pr adequately provide for them. Uh, and of course, our foster care system is, is suffering under the burden of too many children. There is nothing more important than protecting our kids from children. Uh, there was a wonderful story in the previous panel. I mean, how, how is a kid supposed to sit in school and learn when there is physical pain in their stomach because they're hungry? Their body is demanding nutrition. The consequences are dire. Kids who are hungry, are more likely to experience difficulty learning at school, trouble focusing in school, increased tardiness or absences from school, behavioral issues, and all of that will end up in poor academic performance, which then sets somebody on the wrong trajectory for the rest of their lives. 
about 60% of North Carolina public school students, which is about 900,000 children, almost 10% of the entire state, qualify for free or reduced meals in North Carolina. Many of these kids depend on school for their daily nutrition, and most of that comes in the uh, context of lunch, and, and free and reduced lunch is a wonderful service that we provide but one meal a day is not sufficient. Breakfast is also incredibly important because the kids are going to be in school for three, four hours before they get that lunch nutrition. Breakfast is served each day at about 98% of North Carolina traditional public schools. But even so, many of the kids who need that additional meal are not getting it today. The barriers for kids getting school breakfast include the timing, location, transportation issues, all of those kind of logistical issues about how you fit it into the school system and school schedule. But there's also a stigma associated with free school breakfast. We can solve each one of those barriers if we work together. Uh, I want to first address the issue of stigma. I have school-age kids. I assume many of you all do. Kids are so concerned about being cool and not being on the out and somehow different from other people. And we have to understand that because that's going to drive behavior that to a, an adult may seem irrational. There are ways to do that, such as there's the um, USDA community eligibility provision or option, a policy under which schools in areas with severe economic need can serve free breakfast and lunch to all the students not just those who have a particular family income qualification. So serving free breakfast at no charge to all students, making it universal, is an excellent way of reducing the stigma of being the one that's pulled out and goes to the cafeteria. The, some of the logistical barriers identified can be addressed uh, by making breakfast part of the school day. Some schools deliver breakfast straight to the classroom. Students can eat at their desks and throw away their own trash. That takes the whole cafeteria getting it ramped up out of the equation. Schools that follow that model actually reach about 88% participation in their schools. We can make breakfast in the classroom free to all students, regardless of income level, just as I was talking about earlier. That will increase that program up to 90%. So if you both make it accessible in the classroom and universal, you get excellent Uptake, uptake. Other schools take advantage of the grab and go option. Students pick up the breakfast from a kiosk in the hallway and then take the meal to another location on the school grounds uh, and dis, uh, then throw away their remains. That gets about 63% participation. There's another program called the Second Chance Breakfast System. That's when kids will eat at some break during the morning, uh, usually after first period, and that gets to about a 70% participation rate. So there are a host of different strategies in, in different communities, in fact, in different schools, depending on the architecture of the school or the calendar of the school system, different systems will make sense. And maybe it could be a hybrid of all three. The key is by making breakfast easy, normal, and accessible for all kids, then those kids won't be standing out on their own, and it'll make it more likely that people will get the nutrition they need to thrive at school. Just as kids need to eat before and during school, they need to eat on the weekend and during the summer. In the summer, open meal sites exist in 99 of North Carolina's 100 counties, providing free nutritious meals to anyone under the age of 18. They try to attract kids by offering games and other activities. Perhaps we could tie that into educational enrichment during the summer as well. But only 15% of eligible young people take advantage of that option. We know that hunger doesn't stop when the school bell rings, so we need to do more to get kids to access these after hour and during summer programs. Uh, there are many ways for folks to get engaged, and I'm sure everyone in this room knows of many. Um, there are summer meal sites and food banks across the state that are always looking for volunteers. Uh, there are backpack 
backpack buddy programs at many schools uh, as well as food pantries on site and I see Julie and Alina um, with them I was on the board of our little elementary school backpack putty program Cecilia Rollins fund at, at Wiley and Raleigh and we provided how many kids got but about 30 kids at, at a very small elementary school I mean it's just hunger is everywhere and this is in downtown Raleigh so it's not like we're in rural Halifax County um, so in addition to volunteering in your community I encourage you to also make your voice heard with policymakers. Um, it's a representative democracy. They are supposed to represent your values. And if they're not representing your values, you need to change them up. But you also need to express exactly what your values and priorities are so they can respond to what you think is important. Contact your school board, PTA, school administrators, and elected officials. Urge them to take advantage of what is already available. I am convinced that through direct participation and active engagement with your uh, local policymakers, you all can make a meaningful difference in your own communities. There are a lot of disagreements on a lot of different issues uh, today. This is a very divisive and polarized time in our history, but let's pray that no one wants children to be hungry. We know that happy, healthy kids benefit North Carolina. Feeding hungry children is an investment in the future of our state, and it's the right thing to do. It's just the right thing to do. I want to thank you all for the work that you do on this important issue, and I look forward to working with you all in the months and years to come so that we can together make North Carolina safer and stronger and healthier. Thank you.